there we are. And with that, I'm thrilled to introduce to you tonight, Jeff Burrell. And Jeff said that he would introduce himself to you. So that's all I'll say. Um, thank you so much, Jeff, for being here tonight. And we're really excited to have this collaborative project with you on beavers in uh, Grand Teton National Park. Great. Uh, thanks, Hillary. And, and thanks, everyone, for your interest and participation. Um, as Hillary mentioned, my name is Jeff Burrell. I'm the former director of the Wildlife Conservation Society's uh, Greater Yellowstone Northern uh, Rockies program, now retired, or at least semi-retired. Uh, and prior to um, uh, that part of my career, I, I started my career as a hydrogeologist, uh, looking at the watersheds of the Southwest and particularly the Rocky Mountains. And it was uh, in that work that I began to uh, develop a what's turned into a lifelong interest uh, in appreciation of uh, beavers as an ecological force and a geological force, and uh, uh, that continues today. Um, uh, last Tuesday, I did, I did a, a talk with the uh, uh, the bird club here in Jackson Hole, was looking more at the, the the broader view of the beavers as a, an ecosystem engineer. I don't want to you know, repeat all of that. I'm going to focus uh, tonight's talk more on a um, research project uh, I have, uh, will be beginning uh, this uh, spring, summer, uh, uh, using um, uh, citizen scientists, if there are any interested in uh, participating, uh, and trying to answer some uh, questions and get some more information to aid in the uh, uh, the conservation, uh, recovery, restoration of, of beavers in Grand Teton and in the uh, broader area of the Bridger Teton uh, National Forest. So, uh, just a little bit of a recap: uh, beavers are widely recognized as uh, sort of a classic example of an uh, ecosystem engineering species. Uh, they uh, modify their habitat. Uh, in ways that uh, not only to their benefit, but to the benefit of a wide range of, of many species and uh, to the benefit of uh, people. If we can be a little bit more tolerant and learn to work with them, I know they can be an issue uh, if you're trying to live too closely with them. And, uh, uh, but uh, overall, they, they're very, very, very beneficial for uh, the Jackson Hole ecosystem, have been for thousands of years. Uh, certainly important uh, to us now and uh, likely as you know, we sort of look ahead into a uncertain future with climate change, probably going to be even more uh, uh, important to the ecosystem of this region as we uh, in move into the future. Uh, by their activities, uh, what beavers do is uh, by uh, slowing the flow of water, uh, by uh, aiding in the uh, interchange between surface water and groundwater. Uh, they uh, create conditions that aid in the expansion of riparian and wetland habitats. And of course, uh, uh, white riparian and wetland habitats are among some of the most important habitats in this region. Although um, in area, a very uh, small part of this region, but it's estimated more than 80% of the wildlife species uh, depend on those uh, habitats during the course of the year. So uh, as beavers are more successful in doing what they do and expanding and enhancing uh, riparian wetland habitats, they aid in the uh, conservation of a uh, wide range of fish and wildlife uh, species. And more prominently, more re uh, recognized here more recently is uh, that they also can play a major role in uh, our efforts to adapt to a changing climate uh, by expanding riparian areas and wetland areas and controlling uh, the flow of water, they can aid in, in fire control and flood control and, and drought control for not just uh, wildlife, but the human uh, members of our community. One of the questions that's been hanging over uh, beavers, particularly in Grand Teton National Park for, for decades now is there have been two previous studies of beavers inside the park. Uh, one was conducted in the 1970s. Uh, another one was conducted uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, the 1970s study uh, found that beavers were plentiful throughout the park. 
Uh, their, their conclusion was that beavers pretty much had reached the carrying capacity of the, the watersheds of the park. Uh, they were pretty much just stacked on top of each other. Uh, jumping ahead to the 2000s, they were seeing a drastic decline in the number of, of beaver uh, uh, colonies inside Grand Teton, um, estimated an 80% decline. Um, these were both very good studies. They were uh, well uh, conducted. So the, the numbers, I, we have no, we have their confidence that those are, were, you know, well conducted and their num numbers are, are solid and we can rely on them. But like too many studies, they were sh these were short-term studies. Um, and so we're missing a lot of the picture of what happened in between there. Um, you know, part of that information is going to be lost. We can't turn the, the clock back, but we can use a technique that I'm going to be using to do this uh, survey research project that can kind of look backwards uh, into time uh, because a lot of things that beavers do and the signs they leave persist through time. And we can look back and see those signs and get an estimate of what beavers were doing uh, in this gap and then look the same sorts of studies of what they're doing now. And uh, by looking at, at that and um, saying, let's, uh, establishing the foundation for uh, a much longer term uh, citizen science project that can play a very important role in monitoring beaver activities and how they're doing as we go into the future. Uh, just a little bit of a recap again of you know, basic beaver biology. Um, these are large animals uh, that sometimes surprises people when they, you know, they, they think of them as being rodent size. Uh, uh, they are the second largest rodent uh, in the world, uh, only um, behind the capybaras in South, uh, South America. Uh, they range up to being 50 inches long. The, their tail can be 10 to 20 inches long, big flat scale tail. They're very famous for that. And, as far as uh, famous for that. Uh, uh, in weight, uh, typically in this area, certainly over 50 pounds for an adult and can reach uh, close to 100 pounds. Uh, males and females, there's really no diff size difference between the two. Um, uh, their, their front feet are well adapted to manipulating um, small branches and big branches and muds and rocks and whatever they need to, uh, to uh, handle as, as they're going about their uh, building activities. Uh, they swim very well. They've got web feet and much bigger feet uh, on their hind feet uh, so they can move quite well. Um, some recent studies I, I just came across is people sort of, they've always sort of wondered how intelligent beavers are because they seem to be very creative and adaptive in terms of what they are uh, how they can tackle uh, a wide variety of, of landscapes and, and characteristics and conditions. And um, people that, that know those uh, these sort of issues have looked at that question and uh, looking at the relative size, the, 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 the uh, relative uh, size and, and, and uh, shape of their uh, lobes of their brain, as they've concluded, this actually is a fairly intelligent animal. These are animals that have uh, you know, some basic instincts and, and drives, but uh, they are a problem-solving uh, creature that goes about their day, uh, not just by, you know, by brute instinct, but by sort of thinking their way around the landscape and, and how to, uh, to best adapt to it. Uh, they are, have a relatively long lifespan, about 10 years. Uh, they are mainly nocturnal or uh, crepuscular, so um, you don't often see them out in the daytime, but it's also not unusual to see them out in the daytime. Uh, they're a very social animal. Uh, their social uh, unit is their family unit. Uh, they have very tight family uh, structures. Um, and when you see them together, they are very chatty with each other. There's lots of uh, vocal communications and touching and grooming and uh, seem to be very closely, uh, uh, close bonds and very uh, tightly knit uh, family unit. Uh, family unit typically is the, the two adults, uh, these uh, the male and females mate for life. Uh, they are monogamous. Uh, they will typically have uh, uh, two to four uh, sub-adults uh, uh, living with them. The uh, uh, young will stay with them up to three years sometimes before they disperse. And then they'll have the, this time of year, they'll have the, the kits uh, that were recently born uh, still probably in the lodge with mom. 
they have a one litter per year and uh, typically uh, two to four uh, per litter. So uh, not a rapidly uh, reproducing species uh, compared to, to many. Uh, they are highly territorial. Uh, they are more tolerant of uh, beavers they are related to than beavers they are not related to. They mark their territories with scent mounds. Uh, these are mounds of mud and um, they have a glandular uh, excretion called castorium that uh, is a scent marker. And apparently from that scent, they can tell uh, who's related to who and who is tolerated and who is not tolerated. Uh, they are certainly rodents in, in, you know, in basic structure and, and, and genetics, uh, but they are very unrodent-like in their life strategy. Uh, when you think about a typical um, rodent ground squirrel or bowl or, or uh, such, um, um, those animals uh, reproduce in abundance. They, they, in good times, sort of uh, flood the system with, uh, with little ones. Uh, the young uh, uh, grow very rapidly, uh, reach sexual maturity rapidly, uh, have multiple litters through the year, uh, and very uh, short periods of uh, parental care. And uh, as, as I mentioned, very short lifespans. Uh, that's very different from the, the life strategy of, of beavers. Uh, they are long lived. They have only one litter per year, small litters, uh, a very long period of time staying with their parents. Uh, they are in their life strategy far, similar, far more similar to grizzly bears than to ground squirrels. Uh, that has some important management implications that uh, that should be better incorporated into management. Uh, this is not an animal that uh, can handle um, uh, additional mortality very well. The, the, their populations can be very sensitive to that. In terms of what they do that makes them so important as, as engineers is uh, their activities. Uh, the classic one is they are dam builders, uh, but not all beavers build dams and not all beavers that build dams always build dams. It uh, depends on the, the setting they're in, the, uh, the opportunities they have. Uh, if they are not building the classic uh, dams and lodges, they are uh, living uh, in the banks of uh, streams and particularly the, the larger rivers where they can't really build dams across them. Uh, they will burrow in uh, uh, and live in either bank dens or bank lodges. Uh, bank lodges are just dens, they're just uh, burrows in, into the bank that have a cap of branches and mud that uh, keeps uh, predators from trying to dig down through the top of it. Uh, in addition to the many sort of uh, woody uh, constructions that they undertake, they're also amazingly good canal diggers. Uh, they use mud and a lot of their constructions uh, and are, are very good at expanding their opportunities to access food re resources by digging canals away from the rivers or their ponds. That gives them a, a, a safe way of traveling uh, a distance away from the main pond, uh, getting food, but always have a water escape route that they can go back into. Uh, they also do, you know, classically, they are bark and, and, and wood chewers. Uh, their, their teeth grow here you know, constantly. Uh, they have sort of a orange color because they're reinforced with iron. Uh, they basically have a, a, a mouth full of chisels and, and powerful jaw muscles that power those chisels, and uh, they are very good at going through wood, as, uh, as Hillary had recently noted. Uh, they build dams for security. Uh, their, their dam uh, around their lodge uh, or their, or their uh, uh, bank burrow is uh, their, sort of their moat. Uh, it keeps predators away from uh, their lodges where they're living. Uh, it gives them a safe way to um, move around the landscape. They can have access to a far greater amount of food resources and still be safe from predators. Um, they are very good at building dams, but they are uh, sort of restricted in, in terms of the types of rivers and streams that they can successfully build dams on. Uh, they don't handle high flood uh, flows very well. Uh, they prefer um, small to medium size uh, streams and creeks, small rivers, uh, low gradient in particular. Uh, they, they don't handle high flows very well, so they want uh, very gently uh, flowing water. 
the slopes of, of uh, preferably in the one to two percent range, but they can go up to six percent uh, if need be. Uh, they prefer unconfined uh, channels. They don't like being boxed in by uh, sort of incised channels or steep banks. That it makes it hard for them to uh, maneuver around the landscape as well as they uh, can in unconfined valleys, and they can't expand out as well in a confined valley. They prefer to put their dams on a muddy substrate uh, rather than, uh, you know, a limestone ledge or a, you know a granite. Uh, uh, valley or something like that. They, they use mud a lot of their constructions and so they, they depend on that as a resource. Uh, there's an exception in this region. Uh, uh, beavers have developed the ability to use cobbles in many cases where they and otherwise would be using mud. Uh, they do a lot of cobble constructions when they're initially building their dams and reinforcing their dams and also even their lodges, they will use cobbles to reinforce their, their structures. Uh, they are vegetarians, herb herb uh, herbivores, and so they're eating uh, classically wood. Uh, um, aspens and cottonwoods are, the, are very uh, their favorites. They, willows are also one, uh, but they also eat this time of year as things start to green up a lot of uh, emergent and uh, aquatic vegetation. Uh, in building dams, it's, it's also important to, to, to note and to incorporate into management is uh, Dams take a family to construct and to maintain. Uh, a single beaver, even a pair of beaver, have a hard time of uh, constructing and maintaining a dam. Uh, that takes a lot of work. Uh, and the smaller that family unit is, the more likely the dams are to breach and uh, take longer to repair. And, and during those periods, they're much more vulnerable to, to predators than uh, would otherwise be the case. And so uh, the loss of uh, individuals from a family uh, can lead to the uh, loss of that uh, colony uh, collapse of their dam and the beaver will have to go elsewhere, uh, typically uh, moving more into banks and, and uh, mainstreams as uh, if there's too much mortality in their family units. Um, classic structure here, you probably have all seen this near uh, Schwarbacher Landing. Uh, the main dam tends to be the biggest dam uh, in a set of dams. Uh, um, it's designed to hold back a, a pond, uh, that, again, that forms their uh, security and food access routes. Uh, their lodge is a pile of, uh, initially just a pile of branches reinforced with mud. Uh, then they will burrow into that, that, uh, that structure, uh, gnaw it out from the inside. Uh, their, their entrance is underwater, but the floor is above water, and the floor will typically be covered in uh, vegetation of some kind. They'll bring in grasses and reeds and things like that to make it a little bit warmer and cleaner, and they'll periodically clean that out. Give me just a second. Uh, if they're not living in a, a classic lodge, they will simply burrow into the banks of the streams or rivers. And a bank den is just the burrow. A bank lodge would be the burrow uh, that's then capped with branches and mud to keep predators uh, away from the, the interior. Uh, they dig lots of canals uh, when they have the opportunity to do so. Uh, that gives them access to a much uh, larger area to access food and escape routes in case there are, are predators around. Uh, the, this activity uh, the sort of engineering benefits of this activity for uh, the wider ecosystem is it, it greatly expands the area that's uh, saturated in water. Um, these canals, uh, by extending out from the pond, uh, extend that water uh, surface out. Uh, that leads to the formation of wetlands and a broader area and uh, also greater groundwater recharge as that water expands across a much uh, wider area. Uh, which in turn supports uh, higher year-round flows uh, and some uh, protection against floods. Uh, they are, as I, as I mentioned, they are very adept at going through wood. Uh, even big cottonwoods are no problem for them to go through uh, and can go through in quite a uh, hurry uh, when they are very active. Uh, the main reason that they're taking down the taller uh, uh, aspens and cottonwoods, and, and that is because they, they're trying to get access to leaves and the smaller branches where they can then get access to the, the layers of the, the uh, branches and uh, uh, 
smaller twigs where they can uh, get to the cambium layer and uh, as a as a uh, food resource for them. Uh, that also, of course, creates a lot of woody debris that they can use as they're incorporating that into their dams and lodges. Uh, but in, in a wider ecosystem uh, standpoint, uh, the, they're, they're also producing a, a major change in the vegetation structure of the region. Uh, they're opening up the canopy of the region, uh, creating a lot of disturbances in terms of vegetation types and openings. And of course, typically when you have disturbances on a small scale at least, you get a, a diversity of habitats, which leads to a diversity of uh, wildlife species that can benefit from that. Um, it's a great example here. Uh, again, this is just down from Schwabacker where they've taken down a cottonwood uh, back to years ago, uh, then put a dam in uh, not too long ago, which raised the water table enough that caused the cottonwood to re-sprout, uh, but not as, a, as it was in a single tall channel, but this more this coppice structure, uh, which is very characteristic of a, a beaver uh, uh, dominated landscape. Uh, these are far more common uh, they were far more common historically than we tend to see now, or we tend to see uh, cottonwood galleries where they're all tall, uh, single stem um, trees. Uh, that was not historically the case when uh, Jackson Hole in the West was far more uh, dominated by beavers. It was far more this sort of uh, coppice structure, which creates a wide variety of, of habitat types and food resources for riparian bird species, neotropicals, as well as a whole range of browsers from moose to, uh, to elk and deer. So now into uh, sort of the, the, the work that I'm gonna be doing in the, the, the research approach, a colleague of mine referred to this, uh, describing it to him as beaver archeology. span uh, Basically in the same thing of, of human archeology, span you're looking for uh, artifacts that are left behind to interpret uh, what people were doing in the past or even today, but uh, in terms of beavers, you're looking for artifacts that they leave behind as a, a source of information of what they were doing in the past and also what they're doing now. Um, you know, many species leave will, will be leaving current signs in terms of tracks and scats and things like that, but those are very short-lived on the landscape. Uh, many of these uh, indicators that beavers leave behind uh, persist for considerable periods of times. Uh, decades or more. Uh, in fact, there was a study in the Centennial Valley in Montana uh, where they uh, dug down into the water saturated layers and were able to carbon 14 date beaver uh, debris and uh, you know, being able to push the, the picture of beavers in that valley back uh, thousands of years. Uh, I'm not gonna be going quite that far back. I'm more interested in, in the past several decades of what went on and also of what's going on today. So we these have indicators that, that, uh, that we will sort of key in on. Uh, one of the classic ones clipped are, are, are girdled woody vegetation. Those last for considerable periods of times. Uh, dams built from those sort of materials. Uh, also the, that wood lasts for a long time. Uh, food caches, these are branches that, uh, small branches that beavers will harvest from alongside the bank and then move down to the pond or river uh, so they can uh, eat in security. Uh, those will last for considerable periods of time. Uh, slides are escape routes that beavers use. They are simply muddy paths that uh, beavers will slide down in case of emergency. Uh, those last for a, a while, not as long as the woody debris, but long enough that we get some insights uh, uh, into their activity. The same with canals. And of course, lodges made from uh, the woody debris is those will last for considerable periods of time. Uh, and then scent mounds, those can last uh, several years uh, and, and be an indication of beaver activity and, and uh, be useful in these studies. And, but we're not just looking at the, the what's left behind in terms of the, the type of activity because these, like, these last for, these signs can last for a considerable period of time and will degrade in a predictable fashion. We can classify them in terms of large uh, classes of, of their, their, their relative ages. Uh, we can see some you know, woody debris or slides or food caches or, or all these signs as being uh, current, that is within the past year, uh, recent as in uh, past two or three years, one to two, three years, or um, our past and that's going back at least a decade and in, in, in this environment, we can push that back several decades. 
So we're looking at uh, these as indications of both the type of activity and the uh, time in which this activity occurred. By doing that, by, um, by simple you know, visual observation, uh, this is one of the areas that Hillary and I were sort of laughing about of how rapidly uh, beavers can modify a landscape once they get going. Uh, they can uh, take out a lot of vegetation in a hurry. Uh, these are classically you know, the signs of clipping and girdling. Um, it's a little bit tougher to see, but there's actually uh, three different age classes uh, in this region uh, because there's uh, been a history of beavers in this particular area. Uh, they recently moved in, and so we're seeing a lot of current activity. Uh, they've been here a couple of years, so we can see some recent activity, but they also were here uh, almost 30 years ago, so we were seeing signs of their activity three decades ago. And so we're seeing not just what they're doing now, but a history of how they've been we're using this area. That's very important in terms of uh, trying to sort of fill in those, those gaps of understanding what led to that uh, collapse of populations and we just more broadly how they are changing uh, their habitat use or activities over time. And that also gives us some insights on in how habitats have been changing over time. So uh, the initial stage of this, this research is collecting this sort of information, just walking and looking, uh, noting the type of activity, the type of indicator, putting it into an age class, and, what, and, then, and then of course recording the location, and, and then mapping that out. That gives us a, a way of, of, of looking in a map form uh, what the spatial and temporal uh, distribution of activities of beavers have been for now and for several uh, decades uh, in the past. So how do we use that? Now we've got this map, we've got that information, what are we doing and what's the significance that we can sort of draw from that? Uh, there are a number of ways of, of looking at this sort of information. Uh, one is just looking at the relative amounts. If we are seeing in a landscape uh, lots and lots of current activity, but very little sign, at least in the you know, recent past, the past several decades, uh, that could be interpreted as we're seeing a population expanding into an area, uh, either re re uh, reintroductions or just natural recolonizations, but a population that is now expanding an area, they're using areas uh, in, in far greater uh, intensity and far greater spatial area than they had been in the past, for whatever reason that might be. And then we'll kind of get into the interpretation in the, uh, as, I, as we go along. Uh, the other the thing that we're, we could, might see is that we're seeing far more uh, signs of past activity than we're seeing now. Uh, that is sort of where we are now in, in Grand Teton. Uh, you, know, you walk up these water sh sheds and waterways and, and looks at, at, at them, um, doing these sorts of surveys. We see lots of indications that there was a lot of activity several decades ago, far more than we're seeing now. Uh, that in and of itself, you know, even if we didn't have those other studies, would suggest that we're looking at a population that for some reason is shrinking or at some time in the, in the past between those periods has shrunk. Um, and so, you know, very visual, uh, simple visual observations, recording that, mapping that, and then beginning to try, try to interpret what those, that information is telling us, we can get some insights into population trends and habitat use and habitat availability uh, that we didn't otherwise have. Uh, another indication we might see is that either currently or historically, uh, where beavers using only the best sites. Uh, that's an indication of a population that's well below their carrying capacity. Uh, they, uh, if, the, if, um, if there's no population pressure, uh, they, get, they are very picky about where they can, are going to, to set up their, their lodges and dens. They only go to the best areas. They will avoid the marginal areas because that takes more work to do it. And so if they, there's no reason in terms of population pressure for them to do that, they will avoid those areas. On the other side, if we're seeing both preferred and marginal habitats being used, then we're seeing a population that is far closer to carrying capacity than, than the, the case that I was just mentioning. And so just by looking at that, those sort of patterns, we can get a sense of, of uh, 
where the population is in terms of the landscape's ability to, uh, to uh, support them. Uh, it should be noted that, that beavers, by doing their activities, by doing their ecosystem engineering, not only are benefiting other species, they also are benefiting themselves. Beavers create their own habitat if they've given enough time and opportunities to do so. Uh, if they're working in marginal areas, for example, higher gradient streams, over time, they will reduce the gradients of those streams uh, by uh, causing sediment to be deposited, by causing the channels to follow more meandering paths, they effective, effectively reduce the gradient of the stream, making it a better habitat for them uh, to be in. Same thing with uh, food supplies. They may go into an area with limited uh, uh, vegetation and that they need for food and, 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 and uh, construction. But over time, uh, as they slow the flow of water up, expand the, the wetted zone, cause more groundwater recharge, higher base flows, they'll expand those habitats that not only benefits other animals, but benefits the beavers themselves. And so they can go into an area that's marginal and over time uh, can create preferred habitats. And that's what we would like to see them doing uh, because that means they're over a, a much broader area of the landscape doing more ecosystem engineering, benefiting more wildlife and fish, but also producing all those benefits that human co uh, communities uh, uh, can benefit from in terms of fire control and flood control and drought resilience. Another way of looking at uh, this sort of information that comes out of these very simple surveys is to compare it to what could be the case. Uh, uh, the uh, Utah State University uh, team of uh, researchers based there have developed a, a model. Uh, this is a, a, a geographic information system model, uh, which they refer to as their beaver restoration assessment tool, which goes by the unfortunate term of BRAT, it's the BRAT model that people will talk about in terms of, of beaver modeling. It's a, it's a very well-tested model, it's a very sound model. Now, one of the outputs of this model is based on the observed, uh, what the model sees as being the habitat quality, the model will estimate the number of beaver dams that that habitat uh, of that quality could support. For example, it says the, the habitat of this quality could support 15 or 20 dams per mile. Uh, this is going back, it's, it's not the, supporting the dams, it's supporting the beavers that are creating the dams, but it's the dams that are most readily uh, observable. And so the model ties back to dam numbers, but we're actually looking at beaver numbers by that. And so what we can do with uh, the information that we're seeing from the surveys is compare what we are seeing in terms of numbers of dams per mile along this waterway, this watershed, and compare it to what this model says would be the maximum number. If we are very close to that maximum number, then we're seeing a population that's probably very close to carrying capacity. That has some concerns about it on its own. Uh, on the other hand, we may see a situation where there are very few dams along this reach, and so we're far below carrying capacity. That also has, raises some questions in terms of uh, what's going on in terms of beaver conservation and beaver management. When, what the model is looking at is that really the, basically the same thing that beavers are looking at when they are going into an area. Is there enough water for me to make a pond? Are there enough types and, 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 uh, and, and types of sizes and uh, species that I need for food and woody resources to make a, a dam? Is there enough year-round flow to make it, to warrant putting a dam in? Uh, they don't want to be in an area where they put a dam in, say in the spring and by you know, late summer or fall, it's a dry creek. Uh, that makes them very vulnerable. So they're looking for areas where there's indications to them and for the model what it's looking at is, are there year round flows? Is the base flow sufficient to support a beaver pond colony throughout the year? On the other side, is, it, is, the, is the water volume below what would likely blow out lodges and, and cause the failure of the colony? So sort of looking at the, the, that sort of Goldilocks zone between 
uh, enough water, but not too much water, enough of a flow, but not too much of a flow. The model is keying in on that. The beavers are keying in on that. And so we have this, this merger of uh, the model looking at the world the same way that we estimate beavers or, or anticipate that beavers will look at the world. Uh, and so uh, that, that gives us confidence that this is, this is not just a model that's spitting out numbers, but it's a model that's spitting out numbers that have some relationship to reality. And again, uh, to reiterate re what I mentioned before is that over time, uh, beavers improve their habitat. Uh, they can go into an area that has, say, marginal base flows, but over time, by putting a dam in there, by uh, aiding in the uh, slowing of the, the, that water moving through the area, by seeing, because of that, more water going from the surface into the groundwater table, recharging the groundwater table, that groundwater table is going to support a higher uh, base flow during the late summer and fall when you know, precipitation mounts or snow melts begin to decline. So just by beavers being there in a marginal area, they can begin to make that marginal area more a, a, a better area for them to be in. Same thing with higher flows. They may go into an area that has a high gradient stream, which uh, initially may be very damaging to their dams, but over time they'll put in enough dams particularly dams above their main dam, those secondary dams above their main dam help protect the main dam. It absorbs a lot of that energy of the higher flows, diverts a lot of that, uh, that energy into wetlands that surround the channel that takes pressure off their main dam. And so over time, if, uh, if they're given the opportunity to do so, um, beavers again can take a marginal habitat and create a preferred habitat just to their own activities. So we have the observations that we uh, you know, have recorded in doing these very simple uh, foot surveys along the channel. We know the type of activity, the age class, um, and, and map that in terms of location. We've got the spatial di distribution of the activities. And now we've got another way of, of looking at that information, now in the light, not of what happened in the past, and compares, comparing, say, current and recent, but now we can look at current or even past activities in relationship to what the model is saying could be the case based on this level of habitat quality. Again, that gives us another way of estimating how healthy this population is. Is it a population that is far below capacity? Is it a population near capacity? Uh, what we see a lot in the Rocky Mountains uh, region, and, and that includes Grand Teton National Park, is there's a lot more good habitat than there is occupied habitat. And there, there's a number of reasons that might occur. Uh, over trapping certainly could be a, a case outside of the park. It's certainly not the case inside Grand Teton National Park. Uh, they, they are subject to uh, disease outbreaks the same way we are. Uh, they're very sensitive. The, the main one is, is tularemia, which can take out large populations uh, fairly quickly. But there's another um, aspect of beaver habitat, particularly in sort of the mountainous regions that we tend to see, is there's a disconnect between where beavers are now, say, in the main stems region or around those main stem region is, and what is high quality habitat higher in, uh, in higher in, in elevation. Um, um, both, we can observe that the, the, there is high quality of uh, habitat in those areas. This is like the headwaters of, of uh, watersheds. Um, uh, and the map and the, uh, the model will show us the same sort of thing. Um, that, that tends to be an issue of connectivity, uh, that there are, there are habitats that the beavers either can't get to or really don't want to get to because the intervening habitat is sort of below the standards that they would prefer it to be. Uh, there's a couple of ways to get around that. Uh, one of them is uh, relocations. Uh, there's a long-term um, uh, effort in, in this region run by the Wyoming Wetland Society, uh, now going on more than 20 years, uh, where uh, uh, humanely they, and, and with uh, very beaver knowledgeable and beaver friendly people doing it. Uh, they are relocating beavers out of uh, 
conflict areas uh, in private lands and relocating them into a high quality habitat uh, on the Forest Service lands. Getting over that, that connectivity problem, getting beavers up to where there is good habitat. Uh, what we're seeing now in many parts of the park uh, are that uh, as that effort has succeeded, we're seeing those populations thrive and now beavers moving down uh, the watershed from the Forest Service back into the park, improving habitat along the way, improving it in terms of beaver standards along the way. Um, uh, the, the Ditch Creek there by the Teton Science School is a, is a great example of that. Uh, we're seeing beavers come back into that area where they've been missing for 30 years um, because they've been doing quite well in habitats on Forest Service lands above there and can now spread down um, uh, in, into Ditch Creek and, and improving it along the way. Uh, one of the field trips will be uh, uh, organizing here uh, this, this spring will be sort of uh, looking at that story of uh, successful uh, recolonization uh, of an area where they once were 30 years ago or more, and now they're coming back into it and expanding down the watershed uh, uh, as, as they uh, are, have a, a, a longer term presence in that watershed. Um, another way of getting around this connectivity issue uh, is an approach that uh, a number of us began to develop uh, all the way back in the 1970s. That's like ancient history for some of you, but um, it's, it's a number of us were working in the southwestern U.S. in the 1970s, uh, looking at the need for large-scale restoration uh, uh, efforts to, to be underway, uh, seeing that there was no way there was enough money to do this with heavy machinery, and wanting to very much avoid heavy machinery restoration because it's so damaging to the ecosystem. And so what we hit on is, well, we can't ask beavers to come into these areas because they're completely trashed. Uh, but we're not depending on those areas for our livelihood or security. You know, we can go in there and mimic beaver activity, build quasi beaver dams and begin to uh, restart the recovery of the ecosystem the same way beavers would if they could survive in that landscape. And what we hit on was that we can do this. We see uh, a, a very rapid recovery of the ecosystem. Uh, and gets it up to the level of then beavers could come in and then take it from there. And so in areas where there are disconnects between where beavers are and upland areas where uh, there is good habitat, you can also do that sort of restoration to improve that connectivity uh, between those, uh, that population and habitat. Um, both of them, both that sort of restoration and relocation have proven to be very successful. Um, they can be used uh, on their own, uh, but they are most effective when they are coupled together. Uh, that gives opportunities to get beavers where we want them, where they can survive now, but then we also laying the foundation for them to expand down from that uh, more rapidly than they could on their own. So we're doing this activity and we're seeing this, this information come out of it. What's the value of, of doing this sort of step down through that? Well, initially what we can see are the spatial and temporal trends in beaver habitat use in this region. Uh, from that, we can get insights into population trends, increasing, decreasing, at capacity, below capacity, bar below capacity. We can see trends in habitats. Um, are there, are there limits on habitats that are uh, creating uh, obstacles for beaver recovery? Or, or are there lots of good habitats? And we just have to get to help beavers to get to there and then help them to expand from there. You know, as we're developing that information, we get more and more information that we can then uh, convey to the management agencies, the Forest Service and the Park Service, the uh, Fish and Game agencies, so they can make more informed, better beaver and beaver habitat management decisions. Uh, if those are if those succeed, and then what we'll see. Uh, sort of this cascading effect coming down from this very simple approach to doing this, this survey is more ecosystem engineers out there, beavers doing all their work you know, out there in the system. Uh, that's creating more and better riparian and wetland habitats for themselves and for wildlife and, and fish in this region and for us in this region. 
and also a, um, uh, ultimately a, a better climate change adaptation Jackson Hole, more resistance to fires and floods and droughts. And so, you know, this type of survey seems very simple. It, it seems very low tech and, you know, is this even worth doing? But um, I've, I've done this in many cases in the past, as, as many others have used this approach. It's a well-tested approach of, of, of collecting information on beavers. It provides a lot of useful information that provides a sort of cascade down from, yeah, we're mapping this, so what, down to we're making much better decisions for beaver and beaver habitat management. And then we see that cascades down to better uh, habitats for wildlife, better habitats for us, and a better ecosystem as we're moving more and more into this uncertain climate change future. Uh, end up, uh, first of all, just yes, thank you for your, your, your time and, and interest in doing this. I thought this was sort of an interesting picture to sort of highlight some of the things I've been talking about. If you can see my cursor, uh, of course, that is a beaver dam. Uh, that is a food cache. Uh, that is a beaver slide. So they've been harvesting willows from up here, sliding them down into their pond, storing them so they can eat them in, in, in security. There's a bank den under this little bit of a bluff. And so, you know, even by looking at a photo, you can do, you know, a pretty quick assessment of, you know, what's going on in beaver world just by looking at some very simple indications of, of, of what they're doing uh, and how long ago uh, that's been. Uh, if you look further down this channel, this photo is probably seven years old now. Uh, at that time, this area, if I just lost my cursor, this area, which at that time was basically a, a cobble uh, bar, uh, now is a wetland covered with uh, merchant vegetation. And so we were just seeing in a, in a small sort of snapshot the, the, the many things that beavers do that have a wide range of benefits for, for us and our, uh, our wild neighbors. And with that, uh, thank, again, thank you and happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was so fascinating and I learned so much. <laughs> um, there were a couple of questions that came into the chat. So I'll ask them in the order that they came in. Um, the first question was uh, how we can make recovery happen of this beaver population in the face of continued beaver trapping. So could you discuss um, the implications of beaver trapping on that recovery a little bit? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. As we get more and more information and, and great, greater realization among a wider range of the public of just how important beavers are, to our ecosystem, even setting aside climate change for a moment. Uh, there are so many issues that we work on and actually spend a fair amount of money on in terms of you know, various species recovery efforts that ultimately tie back to habitat questions. And, and, and many of these species, they tie back to riparian and wetland habitat issues. And so uh, there's growing recognition that uh, in many cases, the most effective way to solve, to protect the, the widest variety of other wildlife species is to protect beavers. Uh, again, and now throw on climate change. Uh, we're going to be dealing with watersheds that are completely different from what we've been living with uh, in recently. Um, I am confident that beavers can play a very uh, important role in helping modify those changes, buffer those changes, delay those changes. It's gonna, yes, it's gonna be uh, certainly warmer. We're gonna have higher periods of runoff, uh, but I have worked with beavers in areas that are much hotter than what we're gonna be expecting, uh, much more prone to monsoonal downpours and beavers do quite well in those areas. And so I'm quite confident that if we will do our part in improved beaver management, uh, that beavers will, uh, can play a very effective uh, role in partnering with, with us, but they're gonna need our help. And how we think about managing beavers needs to change. Uh, it was never a good management approach to begin with. As I mentioned, 
Uh, beavers are far more like grizzly bears than they are ground squirrels. They don't respond to uh, unregulated or, or excessive mortality, additional mortality than what they already face. Uh, we would not ex uh, expect grizzly bears to, uh, to, to thrive under the types of managements that we are subjecting beavers to. Uh, we went through that and the grizzly bear population collapsed. Um, if we want beavers to play the roles that we want them to be, we need to think about managing beavers in a new way. And that is not necessarily no trapping, but trapping that is well informed by uh, extensive monitoring of populations, extensive uh, assessments of how many beavers do we need in the watershed to provide the ecosystem services we need, which is far above the numbers that we have now. And if there's any trapping that needs to occur above that population level. And so we need a long period of recovery to get beavers back up to the levels that we need them to be. If they recover that well, fine. You know, if, if they're, you know, if there's, it gets to be where there's an ex excess of beavers or there's uh, issues with beaver overcrowding, then trapping can play a very effective role, the same way that hunting can play a very effective role. But it can't be done if there's not solid monitoring of populations, of population trends, uh, of, of target of populations based on uh, not just that they're there, but are they there in numbers that we need them to play the ecosystem services role that we're looking to. So uh, yes, uh, we need to drastically rethink beaver management, beaver habitat management, coexistence of, with beavers uh, so that we can benefit from what they can do and trapping certainly is in that mix. Again, uh, when we reach the point where we're seeing overcrowding, then yes, trapping could play an important part of beaver management, uh, but that's not the case now, not in most areas. Thank you for that comprehensive answer. That was great. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in here, so I'm gonna try to blast through them um, because it is almost seven here. But we have another question from Reed and Dave saying, what are the beaver's predators? And this is a three-part question. Um, they also ask, what are man-made threats to beavers and are they being affected by climate change? Which I think you've kind of already also just went over in the last answer. So maybe just talk about the predators. Uh, predators are the standard large predators. I mean, uh, uh, there's a uh, young, young uh, hydrologist, uh, beaver researcher named, named Emily Fairfax, who uh, describes beavers as being walking, walking chicken McNuggets. I mean, they're basically an enormous food resource for any predator that can catch them. Uh, beavers, when they have a secure pond and the pond is, is maintained by the family unit, again, this is, you know, this goes back to management issues that we need to uh, think of, of management of beavers in terms of family units. But in that pond, they are fairly secure. Uh, they, they are, those ponds are designed to protect uh, uh, from predators. Their escape routes are designed uh, to protect them from predators. Uh, the, the main uh, uh, class of beavers that are most at threat from predators are the young adults as they're dispersing because uh, they're moving into areas where they don't have those, those secure ponds already. They may be moving from one watershed to another watershed over land. Um, and so like most young dispersing animals, those are the ones most at risk. And you know, the, the, the predators are, you know, sort of you name it from um, coyotes, if it's a small beaver, bobcats maybe if it's a small beaver, but certainly mountain lions, black bears, grizzly bears, wolves, sort of the classic large predators that we have here. Um, but all of these animals coexisted with each other, co-evolved with each other. Uh, beavers know how to stay safe from uh, large predators if we are managing them so that they have the opportunities to do so. It's far more what we do that makes them uh, vulnerable than what would naturally be the case in terms of their vulnerability. In terms of man-made threats, uh, uh, we're fortunate in this area that we don't have the, the, a lot of the situations that I've seen in Montana and in Idaho. Uh, you don't see a lot of water diversions uh, in this region, uh, maybe because there's not a lot of agriculture, but uh, fortunately uh, our watersheds are, are much better shape than you typically see in a lot of the areas in Montana, and even the greater Yellowstone portions of Montana and Wyoming. 
uh, they're going to have to dig themselves out of a pretty deep hole before they can sort of look at the, the situation that we can. Uh, we've got a lot of good watersheds. It, it's more sort of uh, tweaking what we have and improving uh, certainly beaver management uh, more than beaver habitat management. Uh, and if we give them the opportunities, beavers do a very good job of managing their habitat on their own. Of course, there's, there are going to be coexistence issues whether you're a private landowner and they're in your, your, your uh, drainage ditches or they're forest services and culverts, but there are good steps that we can take to, to, to uh, get around those issues. There's well-proven techniques now that are widely available. Uh, there's a local group here called uh, uh, Wyoming, un uh, un un Wyoming Untrapped uh, that uh, has a, a Lauren Taylor is their, uh, their ED. She's a wildlife biologist, very knowledgeable in terms of coexistence measures, has funding to help uh, defray some of the cost. And so those sorts of issues we can get around. They're, they're an annoyance uh, uh, that we can you know, sort of have to deal with, but uh, that's not the main threat that we're going to see from, from, uh, for, for beaver uh, recovery and restoration. It's an important picture because they're all part of the same population. Um, and, and relocations are part, also part of that, uh, uh, that, that effort. You know, if there's a, situations where there's just no way of coexisting with uh, beavers in a particular setting, uh, you know, move them where they can do more good in terms of the good habitat we have on the Forest Service and, and in, in other parts of the park. But again, uh, we only want to move them into areas where uh, they are going to be protected uh, with a better uh, uh, beaver management strategy than we have now. Great. Thank you so much. That was a great answer. Um, Deb asks, how does the BRAT model determine if water, if the water amount is adequate for beavers, for example, in areas that were occupied by beavers in the past, question <laughs> mark? Like all models, they depend on what's available in terms of GIS layers. I mean, they are stream flow data. Uh, that are sometimes accurate and sometimes not so accurate. Uh, uh, there's that, not that many flow gauges out there that actually gives you real-time information on there, uh, but there are estimates based on uh, you know, watershed studies, and those go into the layers, and like all models, you know, the, the old saying that you know, all models are wrong, but some are, use, uh, some are useful, uh, the Bratton model has been shown to be relatively useful. It, it's, they've done a lot of uh, ground truthing of the model. They've actually done a lot of ground truthing of the model in Jackson Hole. And so they, they've sort of taken those things into consideration and improved the, you know, how the model uh, in, incorporates that. But, um, you know, yes, the, the, the models are only as good as the layers that go into them. Uh, but from what I have seen uh, in both in terms of, of on the ground surveys and, and working with the models, they're pretty good. Um, but, uh, you know, again, it's a model. Um, okay. Well, we have Lisa Robertson from Wyoming and Trapped, actually, <laughs> who has more of a statement. Um, she, I'll just read it to the group. Thanks, Jeff, for the inspiration and awareness. I see that Jeff Hogan is in the audience. He has been working with beavers in the valley for 34 years, producing the film American Beavers. He also filmed the entire life of a pond from its creation to its collapse and building back up again. He would be able to contribute quite a bit to the history of beavers in the valley. So just so you know um, that that person is a resource. And then Jody had a question that I actually also was thinking about during your presentation, just because I'm very naive about beavers and their impacts on landscapes. Um, and she talks about while visiting Malheur, many birders were complaining about the beavers felling the last remaining trees that created nesting habitat. I'm wondering if in a drought in desert area, if beavers are really not that great for the environment. Um, she says also that she always assumed they were really good for the environment, just to clarify that. But I was wondering that too, like, is there a a point where beavers will no longer take trees or will they just continue to take trees until there are no more trees kind of left in a landscape or I'm really naive about this so I was curious too. Um, I guess touching on that last question before I get into the other ones is um, yeah I mean, it, when they're initially establishing a, uh, a colony and, and, and creating the dams and lodges and that they are far more uh, uh, 
resource uh, intensive in terms of their, their use. Uh, you'll see a very a, a rapid cutting, excuse me, as they sort of move in and get established. Once the lodge is up, uh, it gets reinforced each spring and, you know, and, and sometimes during the fall and the, and the same thing with the dams, but uh, much less so. Um, it, it, it's, an, it's an unfortunate situation we, we get in is, is uh, if we had the expanse of habitats that once were here and the, the connections between habitats that were once here, uh, as beavers would overuse an area, they would simply move to the next area. And so there was always that sort of dynamic uh, uh, process in, in, in play. And so they would, they would not just sit there and, and, and eat everything to the ground. Uh, where we are now is, again, we're better off here than we are in, in other parts of greater Yellowstone, but still here, you know, uh, there aren't that many places that, you know, have high quality, uh, large stands of uh, deciduous trees, for example, aspens, cottonwoods, and, and that. And so once they get into an area, uh, yeah, I mean, they can have a very, as, as you noted, they have, can have a very a subtle and, uh, and drastic impact on, on that, uh, that spot. If we had ex, you know, extensive habitats like that throughout the area, that would just be a, a blip on the radar. They wouldn't matter in terms of bird populations. Uh, but the, with you know, their habitat needs being limited in terms of what's available and beaver habitat uh, available, needs being uh, limited, sometimes they're going to be at cross purposes. Uh, the same thing with beavers living uh, near people. In those situations, uh, you know, it would not be uh, unreasonable to protect some of those trees, putting beaver cages around them, uh, beaver defenses around some of them, so they don't just take everything. Uh, they have a very set agenda. If they, if they have free hand, they're going to do quite a job very quickly. Uh, whether they need to or not, I mean, it's just the nature of beavers. If there's a, something standing there and I can chew it down, I'm going to chew it down. And so in areas like that, where there's a sensitive, known to be a sensitive area for bird species, uh, it would not be unreasonable to protect the, the amount that the birds need um, and still leave enough aside for, for beavers to use. And in, in some places I've actually done is I'll just bring in wood from somewhere else put it by the pond and then they can take it and do all their constructions uh, with that. They, they don't need fresh cut uh, aspens and cottonwoods to, to build beaver dams. They just need dead branches. And so sometimes you just kind of help them out and bring in resources during that initial construction phase so they can use that and not overuse the uh, uh, what's available. Cool, that answered my question. Thank you very much. And then we did have Lisa saying um, predators will take care of an abundance of beavers, especially cougars. I think she was responding to what Jody had said. So, um, and Jody thanks you for her for the answer to her question. Okay. <laughs> um, well, if there's no more questions, I can see. Oh, there is one. Bev had a question. When wolves were reintroduced in Yellowstone, there was re on elk, wolves, and riparian conditions for beavers to return. Has that happened? With such huge elk herds in our area, has that worked against beaver habitat? Well, that's a great question, Bev. We never saw the impact of the large herds that the northern range of Yellowstone saw. Uh, those riparian areas were just eaten down to the ground. Uh, there was nothing there for, for beavers to move into. And uh, throughout that range, uh, not only were the riparian areas were gone, because the riparian areas were gone, a lot of those waterways were deeply incised. Uh, what Yellowstone has done is, is as I was mentioning, that they've been using beaver mimicry to go into those watersheds that are so, that are so incised that beavers can't recover them uh, and sort of you know, hand build uh, beaver dams to get that, uh, that uh, initial phase back. And now beavers are, are doing quite a good job of expanding those. But um, you know, there, there's always that, that, that sort of uh, imbalance. It, it was never as bad here as what Yellowstone had. Uh, there certainly were some changes in vegetation that 
uh, likely were somewhat detrimental. Uh, but just looking, you know, putting on my hydrogeologist hat again, uh, you, you never saw the real severe incision uh, in, the, in the, the creeks and streams in Grand Teton or the surrounding areas that they were seeing in Yellowstone. So that alone tells me that the uh, large elk herds were not as impactful here as they were up there. Hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much for all this information, Jeff. This is really great. And I did want to tell the audience um, that we will be having some beaver field trips with Jeff. <laughs> so we've scheduled one, I think we were discussing before the call for um, May 22nd, and it will likely be at the Ditch Creek area, but um, that's not for certain yet. We still have to check in with Teton Science Schools and all that to do that. So if you are interested in joining Jeff and I on one of these field trips, um, that will be the first date, May 22nd, and um, you can email me to sign up. And if you already emailed me and said you were interested in a field trip, it's a good idea to email me again and tell me that you are interested in the May 22nd field trip because I probably lost your email <laughs> in my massive inbox while I was preparing for tonight. So um, email me again, tell me you're interested, and I will also send out an email to people that have previously expressed their interest to Jeff and myself about um, interest in doing a field trip to a beaver uh, dam area. So Renee says, finally, the last comment of the night, Jeff, you are such an amazing wealth of knowledge. Thank you so much for sharing all this good info. And I think I will end on that note. So email me to sign up. Oh, Jeff Fogan also says he loved this presentation. So there you go. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> um, thank you guys so much for being here tonight. And I look forward to seeing you on the 22nd at the field trip. Um, email me to sign up. And I'm going to end the Zoom call. So thank you so much, Jeff. And we Thanks. will see you soon. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Everybody. Thank you, Jeff. All right, I'm ending the call. <laughs>